everyone. Welcome to our next webinar in the Digital Blur series. I'm Rajiv Jaraman, founder and CEO of Nongscape. I saw a meme on the internet the other day which asked a simple question. Who is leading digital disruption in your organization? Option A, the CEO. Option B, the chief digital officer or the CDO. Option C, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. so, jokes apart, this is for real, right? Organizations and industries are scrambling to uh, go completely digital. Many of them are facing an existential threat if they don't quickly transform the way they work. One such industry or a segment that is supposed to be facing a moment of reckoning is the university segment. There is a fundamental issue that has been existing in this industry uh, for a long time that COVID now is bringing to sharp focus. Tuition fees skyrocketing, student loans at an all time high, institutions taking pride in refusing 90% of their applicants, artificial scarcity created in the application process to name a few. As the fall semester is approaching in the US, many global universities are unsure of how to go about delivering their programs. Are we going to witness a large scale disruption in this industry? What's going to be the impact on the corporate learning side. To help us understand these critical questions, we have someone I've had the pleasure of knowing over many years, Professor Neeraj Dawar. I don't know if you know the history of Nolscape. Long before we um, became a leading experiential learning provider for the world's best organizations, we were working closely with the academic segment. Started with INSEAD, then NYU Stern, Northwestern Kellogg, ISB in India and so on. We were developing world class simulation products along with professors in the top 1015 B schools. It is during that time that I had the chance to interact with Professor Neeraj in uh, the same context many years ago. Ever since I've been a big fan of his work <laughs> and more recently he was kind enough to write a testimonial for my book Clearing the Digital Blur. A little bit of introduction about Professor Neeraj. He is a professor emeritus at the Ivy Business School in Canada. He's the founder of the Brand Strategy Group Limited. He's the author of the best selling book called Tilt, T I L T, Tilt, Shifting Your Strategy from Products to Customers, published by Harvard Business Review Press, winner of the Strategy Plus Business, Business Book of the Year Award, as well as several Harvard Business um, Review articles that flesh out the strategy implications for organizations. It's a wonderful book. I recommend that you pick it up. His current research focuses on the impact of technology on consumer interactions with business. He advises and consults with uh, senior executives from Fortune 500 companies across geographies and industries. Professor has served on the uh, INSEAD faculty in France and Singapore and as a visiting scholar at the HKUST the William Davidson visiting research professor at the University of Michigan and a visiting prof at, uh, prof at uh, IMD in Switzerland. Real pleasure to have you with us, Professor Neeraj. Welcome to the webinar. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rajiv, for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I have to say, if you haven't, um, well, hello to everybody, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And if you haven't yet had the pleasure of reading Digital Blur, I highly recommend Rajiv's book. Uh, it's an eye opener in many ways. And, and I think uh, some of the analysis that we will do today with respect to the impact of COVID on uh, the university sector is informed by the frameworks that uh, Rajiv laid out in the book. Uh, so unbundling the university is what I've called this session. But let's uh, let's before we get into the university, let's go back a little bit in history. Let's look at what happens to theater in the 18th and 19th centuries. If if you know if you go back to that far, you find that every village, every hamlet had its own entertainment, its own theater troupe which would put on one or two shows every year, depending on the size of the village. But think about the economics of that. They had limited audience, therefore limited entry fees, therefore limited amounts of money, 
to spend on the quality of their productions, including the actors and the props and the costumes and the sets and so on and so forth. And so they were fairly limited in what they could produce. Along comes a different distribution technology as transportation becomes cheaper through the 18th and 19th centuries, you start to see traveling troops, troops that go from one village to another. And this changes the economics and it changes the dynamics of competition. How? Very simply, uh, when you think about a traveling troop, they only need to produce one show which they can take from village to village to village over a period of a year, maybe two years, maybe even longer. And as a result, they have some economies in not having to produce a different show every year. They also become specialized and they become much more, uh, much better at what they do. They have one set of costumes, one set of sets, they have one set of props and all of those create economies of scale. That changes the nature of competition between these traveling troops and the village troops. What that does is it makes village, um, the village theaters much more likely to have to uh, either grow or shut down. In other words, it creates a consolidation. If theater troops can travel from village to village, so can the audience now begin to travel from the smaller villages to the larger villages and that's where the theaters become to be located. So you start to get this kind of consolidation happening in the industry. The competition changes, the consolidation changes and then along comes a shock and the shock is moving pictures. What this does is this is also a new distribution technology where the instead of having to have the entire troop travel from village to village, you can record, you can record the entertainment on film and just have the celluloid travel from village to village or from city to city. This changes the economics radically because now you can centralize production, you can start to create special effects, you can start to create, use very large scale uh, you can you know, props such as trains, such as roads, such as cars, such as the outdoors and so on. And that becomes a very different game than producing a show, producing a theater play in a village. This starts to consolidate the industry, not just in, you know, in the larger villages, but in one location, in one location worldwide. And all of this happens because the distribution technology has changed. So changes in distribution technology, the ability to carry the theater troupe, the ability to carry the entertainment from one location to another, creates this opportunity where competition changes, concentration changes, the economies of scale change, and everything gets located in one location so that now, if anybody wants to create a film or a theater piece in competition with something that is coming out of Hollywood, they have to have, they have to surmount the barriers to entry, which include things like the brand names of the stars. They have to surmount the barriers of entry of technology. Uh, Hollywood owns and concentrates those technologies and continues to move uh, on the frontier of things like CGI and special effects and so on, which leaves all of the other players behind. That movement in technology further concentrates the industry. And then along comes a player that also leverages distribution technology to change the industry once again. And here the changing by using the internet as a distribution mechanism, they change things like pricing. They, they turn the entire industry into a buffet, which basically is about eat all you can, watch all you can for a fixed price. And that once again changes not just the competition between producers, but in fact moves the power in the industry to Netflix, to the distributor. So these downstream shifts in technology 
create huge shifts in the structure of the industry, in the concentration of the industry, in the competition that takes place in the industry, in the dynamics of the industry. And I tell you this story from theater troops in villages all the way to Netflix to basically argue that this is what is happening to universities and it is being this accelerated development is being compressed into a very short time span. Now, there are different types of universities and they will be impacted differently by COVID, which has basically changed the way we deliver, in other words, distribute content to our audiences. Universities are organized in different ways, in different levels of the, um, of, of the industry. There's the top tier, the medium tier, and the bottom tier, and their economics are different. They, uh, their prices are different. Their level of, uh, their reach is different. For example, top tier universities tend to be global. They draw from a global student base. They talk to the global audience. They have global brands and their resources also tend to be uh, globally sourced, their faculty uh, and their funds. The bottom tier uh, are local state universities. These are the local theater troops of uh, the 20th century. This is where the university is delivered to a local catchment area. These are third tier state universities, for example, or even city universities. And here, the game is very different. The economics is very different. They're often subsidized on a per student basis by the provincial government, the state government, uh, and or, or even federal funds. And as a result, uh, their economics are, are different from those of the top. And we'll see how the impact of COVID affects these different types of business models, these different types of universities. So the COVID shock may not seem like much. You know, we used to deliver content in a classroom. We now deliver the content online in Zoom classrooms. So not much has changed. We are, we are able to, you know, technologically, we are able to adapt our content and our classrooms and our courses, uh, even our exam writing and our projects to uh, be delivered over Zoom. So that part is not the difficult part. That's sort of the, uh, the you know, adapting to the delivery. What changes, however, is the economics. And it changes the economics because now suddenly students are asking, so what exactly am I paying for? And the university is trying to justify this is, you know, this is all the value that we deliver. So what is it that universities do? Universities primarily develop research, knowledge, and innovation, uh, particularly at the tip of the at the top of the uh, the pyramid. More the more the higher you go in the in those three tiers the more likely it is that the university spends most of its money on knowledge generation, on research, and on innovation. Then comes teaching and skill development, and these are delivered uh, in the classroom, and this is the part that has been impacted by COVID. But just because this part has been impacted by COVID does not mean the other parts remain unimpacted by COVID and unimpacted by the ability to deliver online, but universities also are the hub for sports and arts and human and youth development. <clears throat> they're, the, they're the place where students come to network, not just students, participants and, and people in the community come to network with each other. They're also places where students will build lifelong friendships through socialization. They're also the place where you don't just impart knowledge and skills. This is the place where students understand what it means to live in a society, what it means to be part of a community, what it means to be part of a larger group. And of course, universities are the centers of many, many firsts. Your first job, your first time living away from home, your first time partying on your own, your first time on a field trip outside of your hometown. 
There are many, many firsts associated with universities, and it, I would argue that it is those firsts, it is those firsts that create an emotional bond with the university. And that emotional bond lasts a lifetime so that universities are very, very dear to their, to their alumni. And alumni look back on their university time as some of the best times in their lives. The places where they built lifelong friendships, the places where they found their first job, their first calling, and their first boyfriend or girlfriend, and so on. This is a very, very much a, an experience and an experiential place. And now you can imagine if that is true, and if the university charges money, not just for the not just for the teaching that we impart, but for all of these things, the fees that student students are willing to pay, they're willing to pay because of all of these things. But imagine now that you do, no longer are able to put together that community. You're no longer able to bring people together on a campus. Those, many of those firsts will not happen on the campus. They will happen elsewhere in community groups, in local sports club groups and so on. But think about how many of the university's activities depend on people coming together in small classrooms, talking to each other in proximity in groups, in small groups, in teams, in classes and courses and so on. All of those are now suddenly being questioned. And as a result, we are in a in a situation where our delivery business model changes. And therefore, it's not just about a transition from teaching in class to teaching online but a questioning of how can we deliver all of this value? How can we create this type of experience online and not just in the classroom? What it also does is it gets the students asking, what are we paying for? We're paying for skills and education, sure, but we're also paying for a badge, an affiliation, a membership of a club, which will last a lifetime. And that attracts a significant premium. If you're going to Harvard, you're willing to pay the $60,000 a year in fees, plus the living expenses and so on. It also, there's value in networking and socializing and all of those firsts, of course, and there's the fact that you're paying for the residence if you want to live on campus and have the full university experience. You're paying for food, you're paying for activities, and all of these are revenue generators for the university. In fact, just the last three account for almost 10% of the university's revenue. So when you start to think about what the students are paying for and what they will no longer be willing to pay for or for which they will start to question the value, all of these things come into play. It's not just the shift online. It's not, not just the shift to online teaching. Now, when you start to think in terms of the consumer's changing value function, the student's changing value function, what should I be willing to pay for? And at the same time, start to think about the university's value creation function. Will those two match? What we know is that over the last few months, many universities, particularly in the United States, have had their students sue them for a refund on their fees because the students feel that their online experience is nowhere near what they were expecting to have when they paid the fees, when they joined the programs that they joined. And as a result, you have a situation where the students have clearly seen that the online delivery mechanism is a lower value where they're not missing out on a large part of what they thought they had paid for. And the universities are resisting trying to readjust their value function, doing everything they can, scrambling to try and recreate the experience online, but not always successfully. So, so you have this disconnect. And when you look at the sources of funds of a university, the, the accounts, this is a typical university, as I said, the, this model varies quite a bit depending on whether the university is a top tier university or medium tier university or a bottom tier university. And because this model varies a lot, it's difficult to make generalizations. But what we do know is that if you start to subtract 
at even 50% of the tuition fees. And if you take out all of the other local expenses, such as parking expenses and residence expenses and food expenses and expenses related to field trips and so on, which the universities used to benefit from, suddenly you're left with less than 70% of the money that you had. Now, now think about it. You know, there are some people who argue that the universities had this coming. The universities had margins of 90% uh, on their teaching activities. That's not quite true. If, you know, universities, it's true that universities have a business model very similar to software in the sense that your marginal cost is very low and therefore your gross margin looks very high. But in fact, all of your costs are in development and all of your costs are in research and faculty development and so on, which are not direct teaching costs. So it's hard to say that, you know, because you have such big gross margins, the fact is most of our expenditure happens as overhead. And so the, as a result, the gross margins may look high, but our net margins are actually fairly thin. And therefore, a 20 to 30 percent reduction in incoming funds can be very, very significant, very significant for a university. Now, obviously, as I said, this will have a different impact on different tiers of the university. And in and just as in the theater industry, just as in the entertainment industry, what you're likely to see is a bigger concentration in this industry. I mean, think about it. If Harvard can deliver its programs without the constraint of a campus, without the constraint of a building or classroom size, it can expand those classrooms quite a bit as long as it's willing to take in students. And you know, there are nine times as many students who qualify to get into Harvard as get into Harvard. So they can dig into that pool quite easily without reducing the quality of their students. Now that they can deliver their classes online and the students can get a Harvard degree online, that changes the economics dramatically. But now if those students start to go to Harvard and MIT and Stanford and Caltech, the question becomes, what happens to the universities in the next year? And in the next year, they may be able to attract some of the students locally, but they, you know, they, they don't have a reputation that is national or global. And because they don't, they don't have the same ability to grow their classrooms as quickly, as profitably as the top tier universities. And the bottom tier universities are in trouble. They're in trouble because if all university is going to be online or you know, 50, 60, 70% of the experience is going to be online, why should a student from a small town in Idaho not choose to do that online with a university on the West Coast rather than at a local university? Because it's all going to be online anyway. So you know, one way to ask that question is, if everybody can go to Stanford, why should anybody go anywhere else? And so, so the, you know, once you start to ask those questions, the economics of the industry change dramatically. And you start to see the beginnings of concentration, concentration just like as ha happened with Hollywood. And these, the larger players, the concentrated players will have the resources, even though they charge a fee, which is 60% of what they charge today, they will have a larger set of a larger classroom, a larger set of students, student body, which will then permit them to make investments in things like online production, teaching materials production, simulations and so on that can be delivered online. And those investments will not be small. They'll be very, very large investments. You can start to imagine course budgets of a few million dollars. And when that happens, the smaller universities can no longer compete. That's the change in economics. That's the asteroid that has hit the university sector. It's not just a shift to online teaching. Once you start to take the online teaching piece out of the university Jenga, the entire Jenga could collapse. And that becomes a very, very significant 
rethinking of the business models and possibly a shutting down of 30% of the universities. That's where we are today in terms of rethinking the business models, rethinking the structure of the industry, rethinking the economics of the industry, re rethinking the competition in the industry. So the impact goes from, yes, we've shifted to online teaching, but that has a whole series of knock-on effects, a whole series of consequences for the rest of the university. It puts pressure on tuition fees, on residential fees, on, on ancillary revenues streams, and then it puts pressure on funding from governments which say, look, you have fewer students coming locally and therefore we are going to fund the global uh, universities more and you start to get this logic of concentration happen throughout the university. So, you know, questions that arise are, if a university is not a campus, what is it? Uh, and where is it? And what does it do? And so the, all of those questions suddenly are strategic questions that need to be answered, which did not need to be answered with urgency a few months ago. Before COVID, people were sailing along, assuming that we were gradually shifting to a 50% online model, but that everything else would adapt around that. What COVID has done is to accelerate that change, and it has really you know, made everybody at each of these tiers question who they are, how they deliver value, how they capture value, how they compete, and what their economics are. So when you start to look at the funds at risk, you start to realize that at the bottom tier, universities could lose 50% of their funds. Many universities in that tier will not survive more than three to five years based on this. In the medium tier, they will have to specialize. They will have to start to ask themselves which programs are most profitable, which programs generate revenue, where can we get the students to continue to pay and so on. At the top tier, there will be concentration. They will need to rethink if we're not getting $60,000 in fees per student per year, you know, if we're getting 40,000, how many more students do we need to have and what does that do to the experience and how can we then create an even better experience online than the students had in the classroom. So the consequences are that each of the tiers of the university has to rethink where it stands, what its business model will be and what it needs to do next in order to survive. And once again, not all of them will survive. So, you, you know, we might get specialization. For example, some universities might become pure research universities that rely only on funds from the government or from the corporate sector to conduct research, generate patents, cooperate with industry to develop new technologies and so on. But those are very different from today's universities. Other universities will become pure teaching universities. Other universities might say to themselves, we can become purely professional universities and drop the programs that do not make money, that do not, that students are unwilling to pay for at this stage. So you focus on engineering, law, business and medicine, and you've, you put all your resources there. And yet other resources, you know, yet other campuses might say to themselves, Sure, a lot of the teaching is, and the students have shifted online. They're all going to Harvard now, but even Harvard students need to attend labs. They need to, they need sports uh, facilities and so on. And we can provide those locally, even though the students are taking their classes online through Harvard now. And so that becomes another possible model for survival. But in each of these circumstances, in each of these pathways, the university ends up being a very different entity than it is today. So the consequences, some of the consequences, you know, there are many, many consequences to this change in industry structure, to this change in competition. Some of the consequences that are immediate will be the research centers at universities will start to compete even more fiercely with industry because industry is becoming very rapidly in many areas, industry is becoming the locus of research and knowledge development. The AI labs, for example, in industry outcompete 
the university labs. Artificial intelligence is being developed even at a basic level, even at a fundamental science level. Artificial intelligence <clears throat> is, happening, is happening more today at Google and at Facebook than it is at university labs. Universities are unable to compete on in terms of salaries for faculty, for example. And here's an example of how industry offers salaries that are twice as high in fields such as math and computer science, very high in physical sciences and so on. And so it becomes difficult to attract PhDs, attract faculty and create an academic uh, pathway for a career when you cannot promise uh, the faculty that they will have a lifelong career. Another consequence is the rise of corporate universities where <clears throat> large corporations either individually or in syndicates are creating uh, campuses. They're creating forums within which to teach their students. They're creating venues which are far more specialized and far more focused on the needs of corporate managers, whether those needs are technical needs or they are managerial needs. The fact is that corporate universities are growing much faster than universities themselves because corporate universities have a much more focused agenda. They have a much more focused mandate. Their goal is to develop the skills they need and not more than that. They're not in the business of education. They're in the business of training, and that allows you to be much, much more focused. So corporate universities are ballooning everywhere, and I've worked with some, and they are amazing. Uh, but they're very, a very different animal from traditional universities. You also have the rise of the Netflix of education, and these are places like Coursera and Udacity and edX and Nolscape. And these are entities that are taking the delivery of training and education and doing it as specialized entities online. So far, they have been held back primarily by the fact that they are unable to offer a Harvard degree. They're unable to offer credentials. And remember, students are paying a big chunk of what they pay for those credentials, for that club membership, for, to become an alumnus, to be able to call themselves a Harvard graduate for the rest of their lives. That is worth a lot. And that is not something these specialized uh, universities, online universities can offer. However, they are drawing talent from the traditional universities, faculty and uh, research assistants and so on. All of those are, you know, they're being uh, employed increasingly by Coursera and edX and so on. And edX, of course, is a tie up <clears throat> with with several universities. It is, the, it is the fruit of the collaboration between many top universities. But this Netflix model can only break into the traditional university model once they're able to offer credentialing or once the people paying for the training, whether that is students or corporates, uh, are, are happy with the training itself and not with the degree or the certificate at the end. In other words, they're happy with the skill development that takes place and, are, and couldn't care less about the degree that comes out. If that happens, if that shift happens, then these online only players, these online, online only platforms start to have the same advantage that Netflix has over traditional studios. They become a distribution driven disruptor in the, in the industry. So what are the conclusions from this? We know that COVID has accelerated change along many dimensions. It has changed the business model of universities. It has changed how universities deliver what they deliver, but they also, it, was, it has completely changed how universities' economics work, where their revenues come from, how they will spend money, the economic size of their classroom, the unit in which they teach, where you know how, what kind of research they will do and how much the research funds and teaching funds are linked uh, with teaching funds providing the funds to do research all of those economics questions now suddenly become very urgent and very important 
The shift to online teaching appears small, but in fact, it is the beginning of a structural change that will define universities over the next few decades and maybe for the century. This radical shift has the potential to question the very basis of what is a university? What is the purpose of a university? Where it goes from here? And finally, changes in universities will affect all other aspects of societies that we live in. Universities have traditionally been within the ecosystems within which we live, within which our companies live. Universities have been the generators of knowledge. They have been the suppliers of talent. They have been the uh, locus of training. They have been where we go to answer questions. And if those disappear, if those change, then we all need to rethink where those activities will happen if we want to continue the knowledge revolution that started 500 years ago. Thank you. So, uh, so completely, uh, completely opinion from my end, that's uh, quite easily, uh, I think, the best webinar I've been part of. Thank you so much for <laughs> enlightening us, uh, presenting um, with such a beautiful story, you know, likening the uh, university uh, structure to a theater, village theater, how it evolved, drawing parallels to that um, uh, to that industry. And, um, you know, looking at your crystal ball saying, hey, these are some, uh, you know, changes that might occur in this space. So fascinating. So I um, request all the uh, participants, attendees to uh, start asking questions um, on the chat window. Please uh, feel free to type in your questions. I'll get this started with a few questions from my side. So um, in your book, Tilt, uh, where you focused on how upstream or product related advantages are rapidly eroding and the focus is shifting downstream towards customers. I think a large part of that was because of this new distribution channels that are opening up because of the Internet. Um, you spoke about the global nature of this downstream shift and profound implications for the strategy of organizations. Now, when you look at what COVID is doing to um, universities and you connect this back with your own concept from a tilt, uh, can you help connect these two different worlds? Yes, yes, you know, Rajiv, uh, with a framework and the frameworks that I teach and write about, I've analyzed, as you can imagine, I've analyzed many, many different industries. Uh, but uh, we, we always have a reluctance to turn that lens, to turn that focus back onto our own industry. So this, this webinar uh, provided me the opportunity to do that. And as you know, I've been writing about this on LinkedIn and elsewhere. I've been writing about this issue. So, so COVID has really got people questioning, got people asking questions about their own industry in the university sector, which I think is healthy, but it's always not always comfortable. Uh, and you're right, when you start to apply the tilt framework to this uh, industry, you realize that uh, we have not been terribly good either at product innovation or at distribution innovation or at innovation in the downstream. What I call the upstream is everything related to the product that we offer, everything we related to, everything related to the, uh, the core offering, whereas the downstream is everything related to the customer interaction, the interaction between the seller and the buyer, the interaction in this case between the university and the students, for example. And in those interactions, we have not been very innovative, nor have we been terribly innovative in the core that we teach. Often curricula have, you know, are, are somewhat out of date. And so this, this industry clearly is ripe for innovation. Some might say ripe for disruption. And I think now and over the next three to five years is a time of reckoning. We are going to have to rethink both what we offer and how we offer it. Hey, Rajiv, you are on mute. Am I on mute? Yeah, no, I think Rajiv is on mute. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Hardik. 
Um, so when I think about learning as a learning professional, right? So um, great learning happens when some of the, uh, the three H's come together. The three H's are the head, heart and the hand, right? That's when I've seen great learning experiences happen, not just when it is cognitive, but also it does something to your motivation, to your heart, and it is yeah. practical in ways that you can apply it. And yeah. that's when I've seen the fourth edge coming into play, which is uh, the habit formation, right? Yeah. And um, so at home right now, I have a couple of kids, 10 and 7. They, I find them sitting in front of their computers for many hours. Um, so when I observe this, maybe I, I'm thinking the system is efficient because, um, you know, it helps the teacher gain control over so many kids and efficiently disseminate knowledge. But I'm not so sure about effectiveness. So yeah. what's innovations can you foresee that um, that can bridge this effectiveness gap? Yes, yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. And I think it's a question on a lot of university administrators minds right now, which is, you see, the, the computer, we live in, a, in an era, I think it's a 20, 30 year window in which the computer has become the delivery mechanism for all kinds of information. This is where we get our news. This is where we do our work. This is how we communicate with other people. This is how we participate in groups. This is how we do social media. The computer has become the sole device that does all of these things. So when you see, you know, when we see our kids spending most of their day on the computer or we're ourselves spending most of our day on the computer, what is really happening is that all of the activities that used to be done by separate things you used to read a newspaper. You used to draw on a piece of paper. Those were different activities. Now they're all on the same device. And as a result, it looks like we're spending more and more time on computers. But I think this is a short-lived window. What is likely to happen is that we're going to see a much greater proliferation of devices over the next few decades, which will mean that you start to get specialized devices because their interaction will be different. The consumer's interaction with the device will be different. Some of it will be audio, some of it will be physical, some of it will be purely visual, some of it will, because these devices require, and so you will start to get different types of learning and activities specializing by device. And when that happens, you will not be able to say, my kids spend all their time on the computer, because sometimes they'll be spending their time with the robot and sometimes they'll be spending there and so on and so forth, you see? So so, so what, what will, we have, we live in a world where we have funneled everything into this one device. And then we wonder why we're spending so much time on this one device. Yeah. So you know, those interactions will change. Those interactions will definitely change. And as a result, universities are gonna have to ask themselves, which are the best ways of interacting with students to deliver learning, head, heart, and hand, in order to form habits? Those, those are much more effectively done through a variety of different mediums, a variety of different media, a variety of different devices than they are through, uh, through this one device. But right now we are all being bottlenecked. We are all being straight jacketed into this one device and we have to find a way to deliver classroom learning through this one device. But what if you had a robot at home with whom you could interact and that robot could teach you how to do a tennis stroke, could teach you how to do yoga, could teach you and, and change your movements and you know, those those types of things will happen and fairly soon now so that you start to see different devices being specialized for different types of instruction. Fascinating. Uh, so Amrita, I think uh, uh, Professor Neeraj has just answered that question on tilt. So I'll move on to the next uh, question um, from Srivatsan. He is asking us, uh, we are under the impression that COVID impacts university learning. Um, so this is a short term impact and will not have a long term impact. What is your opinion? So uh, yeah. I, I in fact, um, you know, sort of echo what um, Srivatsan is saying. So there have been other pandemics in the past, uh, you know, which once you get a solution for, are we going to bounce back uh, to the university system? Because yeah. the value proposition, as you rightly pointed out, there are many firsts happening emotional reason for connecting with that place is a lot higher than connection with the computer screen. So are we going to bounce back to that model? Is this short lived? 
Very good question. I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, we have we have been in this university model for 150 years, and uh, older in some in the instance of some universities. I mean, o Oxford dates back, Cambridge dates back to 1300s. Uh, so, so the answer is the you know you know we we have a longing for affiliation, for groups, for learning in groups, and all of that. That longing will remain. What is happening, what the COVID shock is doing is getting both the students and the universities to rethink what value is. And those redefinitions will be lasting. So even if we decide at some point it's safe to come back to campuses, we will ask the question, does it make sense to come back to campuses? And so and and or are there better ways of doing what we're doing? And if we shift 50% of our online of our education online, that 50% shift will get students to re ask the question, should I go to the university locally or should I go to the university two states away or should I go to the university in a different country? And those types of questions will change the structure of the industry. Right. So once in a sense, once you have experienced Netflix, it's very difficult to go back to the cinema. OK, unless the experience is totally different in terms of 3D or, or something. Exactly. Um, yes, exactly. I mean, here's another example. Back when Amazon started to grow, in the early 2000s, late 1990s, uh, early 2000s, Amazon started to grow. Local bookstores had to respond and re change their business, you know, their business completely because they had to hold inventory. They had limited inventory. They had all sorts of disadvantages relative to Amazon. They were they had opening hours that were nine to nine instead of 24 hours. They had so and Amazon started to uh, you know started to offer a value proposition that was fairly unbeatable. So how did the local bookstores respond? They responded by putting in leather sofas into their stores. They started by putting in Starbucks and other coffee chains into their stores. They started by having book club meetings inside the stores. They started by having meet the author and have your book signed meetings inside the store. None of those things could be done by Amazon. So they, they, they will find new spaces in which to compete. And, and a similar rethinking of the business model will need to happen in the university sector. Now, there is another parallel which we should be aware of with in that comparison, and that is that most bookstores did not survive. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, um, there's a question from Professor Satya Nandini. Uh, we understand the economics of universities um, are going to change. They have to invest a lot on teaching materials, simulations, those whole online platforms and so on. Uh, but post COVID, you know, can you throw some light on how to think about ROI uh, from a university standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. And you see the change in the in the ROI mechanism is going to be what will drive all of the other structural changes because suddenly the top universities are going to say we we don't you know we can't just admit 1500 students we can admit 50000 students because we have the ability to have quality students at that level we also know that those 50,000 students will not be willing to pay what they're paying currently. They will want a lower price. But at the same time, you know, so, so that shift in the economics will drive the investments in the technology. The universities that are able to go from 1,500 students to say 15 or 20,000 students and reduce their fees a little bit but have 10 times more students or 20 times more students, we'll be able to make the investments in technology. Universities that today operate with 20,000 students and then go to 25 or 30,000 students because they're delivering online and because that's all they can attract, will not have the funds to make the investments in technology at the same level. 
And that change in economics will drive a further concentration in the industry. Got it. I think that's a great answer. So there's another question on the chat window. Um, as you look ahead, do you see entities like Coursera, Udacity, and even Nolscape for that matter, being able to sustain their independence and value creation? Uh, do you see them getting tucked under the conventional university system or corporate university ecosystem that helps them leverage Acquirer's brand and balance sheet to expand and grow a new business model that COVID is compelling a pivot to? Fantastic question. That's a fabulous question. Um, I, I really think uh, that uh, Coursera and edX are sitting on a potential gold mine. However, a lot depends on consumer behavior. So consumer behavior right now favors brands. A course taken on Coursera is not the same as a course taken online from Harvard where you get a degree at the end. And that is that that perception is true for both the student and the recruiter. The yep. recruiter will not value a course taken from Harvard on Coursera as much as a student who's gone to Harvard and spent four years learning at Harvard. So until that changes, it is very difficult for Coursera and edX to break into the market. But that is that is going to change at some point. Either the universities are going to say, fine, we will offer credentials through these platforms, provided we can control the platforms. You know, it's like Hollywood studios saying we will sell through Netflix, provided we can control Netflix. Now, we may not be able to control Netflix, yeah. but, but you know, it's essentially the same, the same story. So if they can control the platforms, then they will offer credentials. But then there's the other possibility a little less likely, but the other possibility is that students and recruiters stop caring about the credentials. They're much more tuned to the skills that the student brings, the talent that they bring. Now, it, that, that requires much more work from HR professionals to be able to discern talent and fit with the organization and development ability, not through their not through the students' credentials and their accomplishments in the classroom and universities, but through interacting with those students directly. And once that happens, then the credentials start to get equalized. Okay, that's a fabulous point. It, it has an impact on um, HR in companies as well. So when yes. people get online certifications from different places, how do you really test that this person is ready for the job? That's right. And it pr provided provided HR professionals have the ability, they have the mechanisms, they have the systems in place to make those quality discernments. If they if they do have that, and if they rely on those rather than on the brand name of the university, then Coursera and edX rise. Right. And and just to draw a parallel again. Uh, from the entertainment world, Disney versus Netflix, right? So yes. Disney launched its own platform because they had that content with them. So um, just extending what you are saying, maybe the top tier universities will launch their own Disney Plus equivalents. Um, while they may also play with um, Coursera and Udacity, we are likely to see the emergence of parallel platforms. Yeah, edX, edX is such a platform. It is a university run platform. Right. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Awesome. Um, OK, there's uh, this other question here. Why is it that um, universities have quickly realized what's happening while others in the industry have not responded to this COVID threat? Is it because of uh, the business model being uh, under or coming under threat? So that's a question on the chat window. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to that question is that necessity is the mother of invention. You know, we, when you're forced into a corner, as we were in the middle of the semester, where suddenly everybody had to scramble to deliver their courses online, that then led to a whole strategic a line of strategic questioning that we've just been through, which has been, um, you know, which has which has been purpose changing. It has been life changing for universities. Indeed. And what happens to traditional training and development in the corporate setup? Yeah, that's a question from. No. 
Yeah. So I, I think I, I think there's an opportunity here for corporates to start to develop. You see, when you unbundle the university, you realize that not all of the pieces of the bundle were necessary, nor were all of the pieces of the bundle uh, useful for specific audiences. So the corporate sector may or may not benefit from the chemistry research taking place in the particularly obscure lab at the university. And yet when you go there for training, you are paying for that lab. So because the corporate universities do not need all of the things that a university does, the unbundling of the university is an opportunity to streamline the economics of training for corporates. Got it, got it. And uh, will we soon see, um, you know, iTunes University become a full-fledged university and with technology companies like Apple and Google and Facebook all looking for their next $100 billion, um, are they going to set sites on um, their site on the university segment and come after it? Yeah, you know, what, one of the exercises that I do when I work with senior management teams, we're sitting in a boardroom, there'll be 10, 12, 15 people in the boardroom, and I will ask them, how would Amazon run your business? What would change? And we can spend a day or two or three days answering that question. What in your business would change if Amazon was running it? We did this exercise recently with a healthcare group. What would change in your industry, in your company, in your business, in the way you interact with consumers, in the way you process data, if Amazon was running your business? And I think universities are suddenly asking themselves that question. What would change in our business if Amazon was running this business? And believe me, there's a lot of change that would happen. So, so we, are, we are in for some fun times. All right, let's see if there are more questions. OK, Sudeep uh, has this question. Uh, there's a renowned series on Netflix which claims universities like Harvard are actively working like hedge fund houses and have got about 65% margin to invest for ROI. If we go by this fact, do you think uh, the current disruption can actually even the case here? I don't understand the last part of the question, but um, I think the the question is you know they have a lot of money uh, right with them right now they're cash rich option even going to touch them so so i think there's a few universities at the top that have endowments that will pull them through they have the endowments they manage them well they're able to generate large amounts of revenue from them but even those universities will have to have a change in their economics because new revenue uh, sources, the new revenue is going to be from a different source, from a wider student base paying a little less than they're paying today, and that will change the economics. Now, you know, universities are hedge funds. You can say that of the top 20 universities. There are, there are you know, they're making money off of their endowments. Uh, Harvard's endowment, I think, is over $29 billion. So, so that's very large. Uh, but uh, most universities are not in that position. So they don't have that buffer. And because they don't have that buffer, they have to respond to market changes very quickly or perish. Right. And um, many industries have seen uh, the emergence of the long tail phenomenon. Uh, I think the education uh, space had that physical constraint um, always, right? The size of the classroom or the number of quality uh, professors were, um, you know, delivering these courses. Now with this, um, is, are we going to witness this sudden explosion of long tail in the education space? I think that's likely. I think uh, you're, you're going to see courses because we can aggregate courses on uh, 15th century stamp collecting in Hungary across 100 people around the world who are interested in that topic and bring all of those 100 into the same classroom. Whereas earlier we could only find one such person in the entire state in which we served. 
suddenly those long tail courses become viable. But once again, that might be that might be one of the ways in which smaller universities specialize. They find these long tail courses and aggregate them across the Internet. Awesome, that's a great answer. I realize we've reached the top of the hour. I wish this could continue for maybe one more hour, but fascinating, absolutely brilliant uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Professor Neeraj, for uh, spending the time with us. And uh, good luck to you for um, all the research that you're doing and uh, the books that you will be publishing in the future. I will be eagerly waiting for those uh, books to come out. Thanks once again for, uh, for your scintillating talk. And thank you all the participants for uh, for your great questions and participation. I hope this was useful. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.